hello and good afternoon uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, professor sumilan banerji from center for conventional theory isc department of physics isc as a colloquium speaker today so uh, sumilan uh, did his phd uh, at uh, isc physics department after joining as an integrated phd student uh, i think he joined in 2003 and got hmm? you can't hear me okay hello fine okay so uh, yeah uh, he uh, shumilan finished his, finished his phd around uh, 2011 and uh, under the guidance of uh, chandan das gupta and also tv ramakrishnan and then he moved to ohio to do a postdoc with mohit randeria and after that to weisman with uh, uh, ehud altman and uh, from 2017 he has been at isc and working on different problems in quantum systems so shumilan over to you okay yeah uh, thanks a lot pinaki and uh, thanks a lot to shant uh, and also the imsc for uh, inviting me here it's a great uh, honor to give this talk and uh, i have a uh, lot of fond memories of coming to imsc at different stages of my career as a student uh, looking for get a phd position Uh, as a postdoc and then later uh, visiting several times so it's always great to discuss with people here and learn uh, and i'm really enjoying this visit also after a long time after the pandemic uh, okay so uh, yeah so i'll be talking about some of the things that uh, we have been doing uh, i'll give uh, mostly a big a bit like kind of a overview mostly and uh, talking about two problems if i get time uh, related to this uh, general area of many body chaos Uh, and i'll discuss mostly how many body ca chaos and quantum mechanics uh, how uh, basically one affects each other in some sense okay and also in some uh, general things about uh, chaos okay so before i start so let me acknowledge the uh, people who have done all this work so these are uh, all graduate students at isc uh, uh, phd students uh, in physics department and in high energy physics and some of the work uh, one of the part has been published and other is under preparation uh, so i may not get time to discuss this but mostly we'll discuss from this work okay so let me start so chaos of course uh, is a very popular thing uh, i mean we all uh, see different pictures about it and uh, learnt about it and that typically this is the kind of picture we see that uh, and it's also summarized nicely by this uh, quote famous quote by edward lorenz uh, who probably started all these uh, things uh, that uh, when present determines the future but approximate present doesn't approximately determine the future right so uh, and this is generally pictorially represented by this that whether the flap of a butterfly can create a tornado uh, somewhere in the uh, on different parts of earth uh, okay we'll not go into that uh, but this is what sort of the more uh, <coughs> simpler way to present that same thing uh, the idea uh, so we'll start with uh, the simple thing that single particle chaos which we typically understand well uh, which is this idea that if you have let's say some classical system uh, evolve let's say single particle and evolving under some newton's uh, dynamics uh, and uh, you uh, talk about two trajectories which initially start very close they only separated by a small distance let's say in position then the idea is for chaotic system this uh, difference between these two, two trajectories will grow uh, exponentially uh, and uh, the rate of this growth uh, is uh, controlled by this thing called lyapunov exponent right uh, which you can connect to this uh, sensitivity of the trajectory to the initial condition so now uh, the standard examples uh, that we all learn uh, when we learn about chaos are these famous examples of different kinds of uh billiards uh, this uh, stadium billiards uh, one of them is non chaotic other is chaotic uh, as you can see from this uh, picture of the trajectory so now of course we are interested not in single particle chaos i mean this is also classical picture uh, so the question is how do you go to quantum from let's say this picture starting from this classical picture so that is going from classical to the quantum and secondly how do you generalize for many body systems okay so these are the two questions that come to mind so one uh, so this idea that how do you go from classical to quantum uh, I, i mean we all of course it learn it in some form when we read about quantum mechanics 
and this was nicely done uh, by this work of Larkin and Opchinikov in a completely different context. So the idea is that if you look into this object, that is the sensitivity of this uh, trajectory to the initial condition, uh, you can classically, you can always write it as a Poisson bracket, okay, with uh, respect to the initial position and coordinate. And then as we know that uh, when you go to quantum mechanics, we just replace Poisson bracket with commutators, okay. And for dimensional reason, you should have a H bar uh, there. Uh, so this is how you generalize this. Now, of course, quantum mechanically now these have become operators. So you can't just write this, you have to calculate some expectation value. So you have to ascribe some state uh, to do that. So let's say you take some uh, state and then what happens is that you look into this quantity. Uh, so you just don't average this object, uh, but you square it and average it because typically what happens if you don't square it, uh, there will be of course uh, uh, different positive negative values uh, and things like that and uh, that will typically uh, cancel it uh, when you average. So, so that this cancellation doesn't happen, you square it and average. So classically, uh, uh, if, if it is close to some classical limit, then what you expect that this quantity will go like h bar square e to the power 2 lambda l t, right? And this 2 lambda l is what we will call lambda l from now on uh, for this talk, okay? So the main point is that even quantum, if some quantum system is close to this classical limit, then you expect even quantum mechanically this object will grow. So this is unlike, if you know, uh, unlike other uh, commute uh, correlations functions that we study in quantum mechanics, like let's say single particle propagators and all, which typically decays, right? So this quantity on the other hand grow. So it's very different from this. And now the question is, how do you generalize it to many body chaos? So the idea is that you now just say that I take a many body system and I take some operators. Uh, so this could be just some uh, second quantized operator, let's say the like creation or annihilation operators of particles. And uh, you just uh, define this quantity, okay? So you again define some commutator square and then average. Typically you take operators with initially commute so that this quantity, if it grows, then you can uh, detect the growth well, okay? Because if it starts from zero, if it grows, then you can easily detect it. So that is the idea. So you just generalize this concept to any many body system with some operators which typically have some local support. And the idea is that if you write this commutator square, so if you expand it, okay, in different terms. So typically what is found that out in this commutator there will be some parts which are like standard correlations functions, like time ordered correlation functions. But there will be some part where the time will appear in this staggered way, like t0, t0, okay. So, so this is out of order and that's why it's called out of or time order, out of time order correlator, okay, or OTOC. And uh, one part, so this quantity, uh, if this quantity grows at e to the power lambda L, this quantity you can show will go like some number minus e to the power lambda L t. And from this thing you should be able to extract this lambda L, right. So that is the idea. So this is also called scrambling. Because effectively you can show what is happening that whatever local information you encoded in this operator, let's say this was spin operator, so you encoded some bits in the system and what happens is under time evolutions, this information basically spreads all over the system and you cannot really recover it, okay? So that's why it's also called scrambling. So scrambling in this sense is related to chaos. They are not exactly same. Uh, there are some difference. I will not go into those in this talk, okay? Yes. Hmm. How does epsilon dependence come? Because you have to Yeah, so general. this, okay, so this I will not be talking much. So this epsilon here will be just h bar square. Okay. It's yeah. Not a, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so from this you will ex uh, extract this Lyapunov exponent. So now there is another aspect of this. So this, what I talked about is the growth in time. So you look into this correlator and how it grows in time. So that there is a second aspect to it. Now if you have an extended system, a system which has some special information, let's say system on a lattice, okay. So then what happens is that you can take these two operators at different positions. Let's say one at zero, another at x, right. So they are not only separated in time, they are now separated in space, just like standard correlation functions. And in that case, there will be a position dependence and typically it turns out uh, for the systems which are chaotic. Uh, that this dependence of can be of various form, but typically they have this scaling, uh, which is uh, basically what is called a ballistic scaling. Namely, if you look into this object as a function of position and time, the color is this value of this object, uh, this OTOC. 
uh, the commutator squared. So what you will find that this quantity uh, not only grows as a function of time, let's say at x equal to 0, but it also spreads. Okay? And it spreads like a light cone, like a relativistic light cone, right? with a well-defined velocity. So you can also, another characteristic of chaos, which is this butterfly velocity. So these are the two quantities which are of importance here, the Lyapunov exponent and the butterfly velocity. And this is the two things that you want to look at. Okay, and it turns out even for systems which are for other properties like diffusive or anomalously diffusive, uh, even there this uh, uh, chaos will always spread ballistically. Okay. So, uh, so this is a one example, but uh, yeah, there is, uh, I mean this is actually the example I showed is a classical one, but I'll uh, not go into the detail of this. Now, one question you can ask is all this all this fine, and we know that chaos is an important thing in various things like weather modeling and other stuff, nonlinear science. Uh, but why we are bothered about it in quantum systems, especially quantum many-body systems, right? So one amazing thing about this is that you. Uh, so this was shown by Maldasena Shankar and Stanford that this quantity for any quantum system at a uh, thermal state at a temperature T. Uh, follows this bound that this quantity can never be, be larger than 2 pi kVT by h bar. Okay, so this is called Maldasena Shankar Stanford bound. So this bound is uh, interesting. So this is somewhat like a quantum bound like Heisenberg uncertainty, but it is interesting for many body system because it also carries the information about the state, namely the temperature, but in such a simple way, right? So this is not only fundamental constant, but the property of the state also appears here. And no matter what state you take, like thermal state, it will always be smaller than this number. Okay? So that has been proven. So that's why this quantity is very interesting, because it has some bound. And it may have some consequence of some of the questions in uh, condensed matter physics, uh, which is namely this, that if you take many materials, many different materials, uh, correlated materials, uh, no, weakly correlated materials, and many of them, actually, if you calculate some way this uh, inverse of transport scattering time or the scattering rate, it turns out that many of these systems have scattering rate which are almost equal to kBT by h bar multiplied with the order one number. Okay? So it seems like many materials seems to have some universal uh, thing uh, which is just determined by temperature and fundamental constant, nothing else, right? which seems very unusual. There is no coupling constant really that appears in a substantial way in this. So this is called Planckian dissipation. So we really don't know whether there is some bound on transport scattering rate. But the idea is that if you can somehow connect this transport scattering rate to Lyapunov exponent, then maybe you'll be able to prove a bound for transport scattering rate. Uh, this has not been done yet. Okay, but that's the uh, interest. The second thing is that in some systems, people have found a relation between transport and chaos, namely that you can connect something like a diffusion constant that you uh, obtain from transport coefficients to properties related to chaos, namely butterfly velocity and Lyapunov exponent. Okay? So this is also interesting because one hand you have transport, other hand has chaos, and it seems there is some relations between them. Okay? So maybe by learning about this, you can learn about transport. Okay? So now uh, these things, uh, some of these calculations, uh, it cannot be done in most of the system, but there are certain systems where this calculation can be done exactly. And that's why those, those are special systems. So one system which has popularized this way of looking into correlated system is this uh, famous uh, Sajdevye Kitayev model. Uh, which is a model for a non-fermi liquid. Let me just briefly describe this model, although I will not be talking about this model much. Uh, but uh, the model I will be talking about will be related to this, okay, uh, loosely. So this is the model. So the model actually has just fermions. So there are some four fermion terms. So you can see that this model doesn't have any quadratic term, like you stand, uh, generally uh, expect, right, like in condensed matter one or something. So it only has an interacting term with a four fermion. And this uh, term has a uh, strength which is a random number which is drawn from some Gaussian distribution with zero mean and some strength. Okay? So this is the model and this is an infinite range model meaning every fermion, so every pair of fermion sites KL interact with every other pair of fermion sites I and J. Okay? So this is the model. 
So this model, uh, actually you can exactly calculate this quantity, this Lyapunov exponent, and this Lyapunov exponent is exactly 2 pi kVT by h bar, okay? So it saturates this bound. So that's why it's a special bound. It's also property of this kind of a non-Fermi liquid. So it gives a hint that maybe using chaos, you can actually characterize Fermi liquids and non-Fermi liquids. So that is also another interest in this area. Okay, so this, so this is the thing. So, if, so it, it might have importance in various things that we try to understand in condensed matter. To summarize and to sort of channelize for this talk, so these are the kind of questions that let's say one can talk about. So since the quantity has a bound, you can ask that like uh, for Heisenberg uncertainty, right? We know that it demarcates between classical and quantum world. You can ask that how this uh, Lyapunov exponent demarcates between classical and quantum many body systems, okay? Because this is a bound, okay? Fundamental bound. So that is a kind of question that how quantum fluctuation actually affect chaos in a system. Secondly, that you can ask uh, if you are trying to use that as a characterization of phases and phase transitions. So you can ask that how different kinds of usual thing that we do in uh, condensed matter and other areas like symmetry breaking and uh, non-trivial dynamics, critical dynamics, collective modes, phase transition, how they affect chaos and how chaos affect them, okay, the dynamics of this system. So that is another question. And, uh, and you can also have situations, so I will discuss if I get time, uh, where you can have transitions uh, between chaotic to non-chaotic phases in many body systems. And there are transitions only in chaos but no other quantity. Okay, so I'll, if I get time, I'll discuss that. So overall, uh, so you get a, uh, uh, so you basically, when you look into a system, many body systems, there are various time scale, I'll not discuss all of this. But typically what we do, we look into correlation functions and we extract, extract uh, relaxation time, right? Now there is this additional time here and you can ask that where this time is placed, right, with respect to other time scales like transport time scales or the relaxation time scales. And some cases we know that the, let's say for example, relaxation time scale can diverge near some phase transition. You can ask what happens to Lyapunov exponent, okay? So when you have phase transition. So these are the kind of questions that I will try to discuss in a toy model, uh, which you can exactly solve. And uh, you can ask some of these questions there, okay? Okay, so this is the first part of the talk. So where I will discuss a model uh, which has many aspects uh, that was discussed in this set of questions. So I will discuss a model which has symmetry breaking, uh, which has quantum mechanics, it's a quantum model. And also it has some phase transition and some non-trivial dynamics, okay? So I'll discuss a model of a quantum glass uh, where some of these things you can explicitly calculate and uh, try to relate, okay, to a glass transitions and other things. So that will be the main topic of this. Okay, so let me try to uh, say about uh, what we are actually asking about this uh, chaos bound uh, or the quantum mechanics, uh, the quantum mechanical aspect of it. So as I showed that there is this bound, so let's imagine that I have a system where I can, yes? Yeah, the statement of the bound is this, that if you take any quantum many body system in thermal equilibrium at a temperature T, then the Lyapunov exponent, if it exists, okay, has to be less than 2 pi kVT by H bar. So for any system? Any system. At, in thermal equilibrium? Yes. Okay. Okay, so now, uh, so let's imagine that I have a system where I can tune, uh, go from classical quantum to classical, right, by tuning some H bar. Let's say I can tune H bar somehow, okay. So then what you expect that this bound, uh, actually there is no bound in the classical limit because H bar going to zero, the bound diverges, right. So that's what intuitively we also expect because we don't expect classical system to follow any bound, like quantum bound, right. Uh, it, I mean, it could be as chaotic as it is. I mean, uh, no, nobody stops it from being as chaotic as it want, uh, depending on interactions. So there is no bound in the classical limit, but the real question is that, let's say you start with a system which are close to this bound and you tune this. Uh, so how actually you go to the classical limit? So typically you would think that classical systems, because chaos is predominantly a classical concept, the way I presented it here, 
it might seem that classical system will be always more chaotic than a quantum system, right? So that's the typical thing that we would expect. But can it happen that it is not the case, meaning that it may be the quantum, quantum mechanics actually makes system more chaotic, okay? So meaning that this approach to the classical limit, can it be non-monotonic and non-trivial? Okay, so I'll actually show uh, this system is, uh, there are regime where uh, this uh, limit will be non-trivial. It will not be a monotonic limit. Uh, although the system that I'll discuss will be far away from this bound, but you will still see that there are different behavior, that the classical system could be more chaotic than the quantum one, but quantum mechanics can also make the system more chaotic, okay, depending on the uh, regime of temperature and parameters. So, so that is one uh, question. Uh, so now, but for that, as I said, that I need a model where I can vary h bar, right? So now, uh, the model that I dis uh, showed, uh, briefly discussed, which is this SYK model, uh, that model I cannot really vary h bar because this is a model of fermions, okay? So fermions are inherently quantum mechanical. So only way you could probably go to classical limit is by going to very high energies. But uh, by going, but very high energies, you don't have much control over these calculations, okay? So I want to do a more, get a model where I can stay at low energies, at low temperatures, and do a control calculations, but have, have a tuning parameter like h bar, okay? So here is the model that I'll discuss. I'll discuss the model. So it's a model of a quantum glass. And what I'm going to uh, discuss is, uh, is that a phase diagram of this model, a chaos phase diagram. So this model that I'll discuss have two parameters. One is temperature, another is this h bar, which we can vary in the model. And as a function of this um, parameter, the model actually has a transition from some symmetry broken spin glass state to a paramagnetic state uh, across this line over here. And uh, we'll try to understand, as I said, that this color bar is for Lyapunov exponent, how this Lyapunov exponent uh, varies as a function of h bar and t, okay? Uh, speci specifically, let's say if I try to take the classical limit, that is, let's say, fixed temperature and try to go down in h bar, uh, do this, uh, this Lyapunov exponent, does it always uh, increase or it can also be non-monotonic? Uh, so this is what uh, is this model about. Uh, and uh, uh, it may, may be also interesting to people who work on classical glasses because uh, this model that I have taken, uh, I'll discuss, is actually has a classical limit, uh, h bar tending to zero, which is exactly gives this mode coupling uh, dynamics in uh, supercooled liquid, uh, if you are familiar with that. Uh, so in some sense, by taking this quantum model, doing a calculation and taking the h bar tending to zero limit, I'll be trying to calculate a chaos in a supercooled liquid, okay? So, so let me just tell you briefly about uh, the kind of feature of a glassy system because that will come into the discussion. So the feature, uh, of course, there are uh, variety of phenomena uh, related to glasses. So feature I am going to focus on is this complex relaxation. Namely that if you go to low temperature and if you look at some typical two-point correlation functions, right, uh, then what you see is a complex relaxation profile. Let's just focusing on this part of here as a function of time. Uh, what you find that there is sort of a two-step relaxation, okay? So there is a very slowly decaying part which is typically known as beta relaxation and then there is a very long uh, time uh, part, uh, this is a logarithmic scale, uh, where the thing decays with a stretched exponential uh, with some time scale which actually diverges uh, approaching some kind of uh, putative glass transition, okay? Although there is no real glass transition in uh, the structural uh, 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 glasses, uh, I mean at least uh, not very clear, uh, but the model that I'm going to discuss, there will be a thermodynamic transition, okay, and where this time scale will actually diverge, and the question is that this diverging time scale, how does it affect the other time scale, which is inverse of Lyapunov exponent, okay? So that is the question. Okay, so let me discuss this model. Uh, so this is actually very similar to this SYK model that I discussed but it is not a model in terms of fermions, in, uh, it is instead a model you can think in terms of some positions, okay? So imagine that you have a system, uh, a particle basically, which has n, which is in n dimension, okay? So this i goes from one to n, okay? So you have n coordinates, and imagine that this particle is moving on the surface of a sphere, 
Okay, so it is constrained to move on a surface of a sphere, and it has some quantum mechanics, uh, which is given by the uh, commutator relation between this position and this momentum. For historical reason, I am calling a spin glass uh, because uh, this is uh, called a p-spin glass, the classical part of this. Uh, uh, but it is basically this model. It, uh, yeah. It's a, you can say single particle, but or, or you can say there are actually n spins which are interacting, like a zero-dimensional or infinite range system. Yeah. If you think about yes as coordinate, then it's a, it's a single particle, but it's still interacting model. Mm -hmm. And the interaction comes because you put a constraint. Otherwise, they are unconstrained, but you constrain to move on the surface of a sphere, okay, n-dimensional sphere. And you put this quantum dynamics. So in this model, actually, you can vary h bar, at least theoretically, okay, uh, unlike the SYK model, uh, because you have this control over this commutation relation, uh, the strength of the commutator. And uh, this model has this phase diagram, which I mentioned, uh, that you have a spin glass phase uh, below this line. And then you have some uh, paramagnetic phase. I'll be mostly focusing on this. So there is a spin glass to paramagnetic transition. So, so in this regime, where you have small values of h bar, it's a classical paramagnet. And, uh, and in this regime, uh, sorry. And in this regime, uh, it will be a classical spin glass. And then if you increase the quantum fluctuations, then it will go into some quantum spin glass. Okay. So that's the model. And as I said, that if I take h bar tending to zero limit, uh, that will describe uh, this kind of uh, supercool liquid dynamics. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, basically try to calculate chaos. Now, a little bit of technicality. And this is not very important if you don't follow. I'll just try to briefly say how do you do the calculation. So this model is exactly solvable, meaning you can calculate whatever important correlation function is there in this model exactly. Okay, in this limit, that when you take this n to be infinity. Okay, that is thermodynamic limit. So uh, so the mo the calculation uh, proceeds with some techniques uh, which are very standard uh, in classic uh, physics. Uh, so what you have to calculate in this model is uh, only important quantity in this model is this uh, this correlation function. Okay, so this is dynamical correlation function. So spin-spin correlation you can think. And since this is a disorder model, you have to induce uh, uh, put some replicas to do the calculation. So this is a disorder average correlation function. And uh, in this model, the reason you can solve this model exactly because there is a exact uh, uh, Green's function, or uh, you can calculate this quantity exactly in this model. Okay, uh, so I'll not go into the detail, but uh, just imagine that I can calculate this exactly using some. In case you are not familiar with it, uh, with the standard uh, methods of quantum many-body systems. Okay. So, and the parameter that you vary, which is this quantum parameter, which is related to h bar, which is this gamma, uh, which appears in these equations uh, for this quantity. Okay. So this is a matrix. So remember, this is a matrix, and this A, B are the replica index. And eventually, when you do the calculation, you have to, at some stage, take this uh, matrix dimension to 0. Okay. So, so that's the part that you have to do carefully. So, uh, so this model, as I said, has two phases, the paramagnetic phase and the spin glass phase. So the paramagnetic phase, you can easily solve. What happens, a uh, lot of works by Parisi and other, we know that uh, that this paramagnetic phase, this this order parameter uh, is basically diagonal in the replica space and also it's replica symmetric, meaning it's same for every replica, A or B or doesn't matter. Okay, so you can actually take these answers and try to solve these equations. Uh, whereas uh, if you go into this spin glass phase, you have to do little more work. Again, I'll not go into the technicality. I just want to mention that uh, what you try to do in the spin glass phase if you are familiar with mean field theories, so to do mean field theories, you have to take some unsearch for the order parameter, right? So here also there is some unsearch uh, uh, that you take because uh, otherwise you don't really know what is the stru matrix structure of these objects, okay? So you assume some structure of this matrix. And the main thing is that in the structure of the matrix, there is a thing that comes which is known as the Edward Anderson order parameter, which basically distinguishes, at least at this level of discussion, between the spin glass and the paramagnetic phase. So if this parameter, which I call the Edward Anderson adder parameter, become non-zero, then it's a spin glass. If it is zero, then it's a paramagnet. Okay? 
and you put it uh, in the calculations and eventually you take the limit uh, tending to zero. Okay, I'll not go into the detail of it, but uh, that is the idea that you have some equations and you have to take some answers for the matrix to solve this equation. Okay, and you can do it exactly. Uh, so there is now another bit which is uh, you have to also calculate as I mentioned that we want to calculate this OTOC uh, for this system, right? So how do you calculate OTOC? So it's similar to uh, calculating uh, like uh, as you do in quantum field theory and things like that, quantum many body method or any uh, uh, interacting system is that if you know the two point uh, functions then you try to calculate the four point functions, okay? So that's what uh, it amounts to calculating OTOC. Only difficulty here is that this uh, thing is not the standard time order function. So you cannot use the standard technology of uh, quantum field theory. You have to generalize it slightly bit more and what you have to do, it can be done in this thing called uh, Swinger Keldish contour. Uh, again, uh, the main point is that there is a methodology to calculate it which is slightly different from the uh, standard uh, thing. You have to extend it a little bit. But eventually you can calculate it and you can also uh, incorporate the glassy physics in this calculation. So at the end of the day, I mean you don't need to follow all this uh, if you have not seen it before. The main point is you can calculate this object, this OTOC, uh, both for the spin glass and the paramagnetic phase. And eventually what you will find uh, that there, there is a piece in this OTOC which will grow like e to the power lambda L t, okay? And so you try to find this piece and you try to find the lambda L and that's how you calculate this, okay? So to do this calculation, what you have to do, there is a kind of a Carnell equation that you have to solve. The main point is that in the Carnell equation, you have to give input from this correlation function that I mentioned that you can exactly calculate, the two-point correlation function. So if you know exactly the two-point correlation function, then you can put it in this equation and you can actually calculate this lambda L. Okay, so this is the technical bit. Now the main, essence, uh, uh, the main part from this technical thing is this, that if you look into the structure of this kernel, uh, that equation, so the one part where this uh, symmetry breaking appears in this kernel, which is that uh, if you look at a one part of this kernel, uh, the Edward Anderson adder parameter appears, okay? And this is how this calculation, even if you don't follow the details of it, uh, knows about the paramagnetic state versus the spin glass state. Okay, so the order parameter actually appears for the calc uh, equations that determines that Lyapunov exponent. Okay, and this ultimately determines uh, the how Lyapunov exponent is different between spin glass and the paramagnetic phase. Okay, so so that's the technical thing. Uh, so let me just now discuss the results, and these are much uh, simpler to follow. Uh, 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 that the technical thing is not very important. So let me at least try to communicate the result. So, uh, so the idea is, as I said, so what we want to see is that uh, how Lyapunov exponent varies as a function of the quantum fluctuation and varies as a function of temperature, right? So these are the two things I, I want to look at. So let's look at some region in the paramagnetic phase. So what you find that if you are at high, at high temperature, so then typically as a function of h bar, starting from the classical limit, which is h bar equal to zero, so typically the Lyapunov exponent decreases with h bar. So this is you expect, right? So as I said, the intuitively you expect the classical system to be more chaotic. So as you increase quantum fluctuations, this Lyapunov exponent actually goes down, right? However, it turns out that if you try start decreasing the temperature, come closer to this glass transition, you actually find that this approach to the classical limits become non-trivial and non-monotonic. So in fact, uh, initially the chaos increases with quantum fluctuation, okay? And this happens around some temperature regime which seems to track the glass transition line, okay? So there seems to be some relation between this glassy dynamics and uh, this, uh, this Lyapunov exponent and similar thing you can see as a function of temperature, uh, of course, as you can see from this plot that uh, there is a line over which this Lyapunov exponent has a maxima and that line actually tracks the glass transition line, okay? So it seems that the complex dynamics actually also affecting uh, this chaos, okay? So, so this is what I already told uh, that uh, uh, this is the main essence of this. Uh, so, 
Yeah, so and what happens in the spin glass phase actually exactly opposite thing happens in the spin glass phase. Spin glass phase uh, typically what you find that as you increase h bar meaning you become more quantum the Lyapunov exponent actually al always increases. Okay. So, so this is, seems to be a general thing which has been seen for other models that if you have some symmetry broken state and if you put quantum fluctuation actually it becomes more and more chaotic with quantum fluctuations. Okay. So, quantum fluctuation actually increases chaos in a symmetry broken state. In this case, is a glassy phase where uh, the uh, Lyapunov exponent increases and this we can actually analytically calculate and show that the Lyapunov exponent is inversely proportional to the spin glass order parameter that I mentioned earlier. So, so what happens is that as you increase quantum fluctuation, Okay, so as you increase quantum fluctuation, your spin glass order parameter, so the fluctuation also destroys the order, uh, both thermal and quantum fluctuations. So, since the Lyapunov exponent is inversely related to the Edward Anderson order parameter, as you increase quantum fluctuation from h bar from some small value to larger value, uh, the Edward Anderson order parameter goes down and the Lyapunov exponent increases. Okay. So, you can see that the Lyapunov exponent also tracks the order parameter in some way. Okay? So, it is related to this order parameter. So, so that is uh, uh, one thing. So, the two things basically is that uh, the symmetry breaking actually affects the chaos and you can nicely connect uh, the order parameter to the Lyapunov exponent and also the dynamics uh, to the Lyapunov exponent. Now, one question is that uh, what happens across the transition? Uh, so, namely, if you calculate the relaxation time, okay, uh, like the uh, so this relaxation time, which is slow, shown in blue, is calculated from some two-point correlation functions, and this relaxation time actually diverges at the glass transition. So, this blue line that diverges as a function of temperature at the glass transition. Whereas, if you look at the Lyapunov uh, inverse of the Lyapunov exponent, as you can see that it doesn't diverge; it just goes through this transition. So, although yeah, chaos is affected by uh, the critical, uh, the complex dynamic, but it is not completely tied to this dynamic. So, in that sense, it also gives some complementary information. And another thing is that uh, I mentioned that there is this uh, maxima uh, in this uh, plot, right? So, there is a maxima of this uh, Lyapunov exponent, uh, which is uh, uh, following the glass transition line. Actually, it turns out that this exactly correlates with the temperature where actually you this two step relaxation sets in. Okay? So, I mentioned that the glasses if you go to low temperature then there is this complex relaxation with two steps and wherever this two step relaxation sets in that is where the Lyapunov exponent has a maxima. Okay? So, it seems that this might give you a way. Uh, so, this is of course, a crossover nothing really happening uh, nothing radical happening at that crossover. But it seems that uh, this Lyapunov exponent is a giving a way to actually track this onset of glassy regime in this system. So, it might be interesting to uh, look at this uh, quantities even standard glasses uh, like supercooled liquids and see if uh, you can actually detect this onset of complex dynamics using this Lyapunov exponent. Okay. So, this is uh, one thing and uh, okay, I will skip this part because I just, uh, so I have around 10-15 minutes. Okay, I'll skip this part. So let me just summarize. Uh, so the main uh, message here is that uh, that uh, basically we are trying to understand how quantum fluctuation, symmetry breaking, and complex dynamics affect chaos. Uh, so as you can see, uh, that it affects in many different ways. I mean, you can have uh, in this kind of systems with complex dynamics and symmetry breaking uh, some non-trivial approach to the classical limit. Okay. Uh, which is non-monotonic, not a smooth approach, uh, not smooth, but um, sort of non-monotonic approach. And secondly, uh, 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 and uh, you can see that the symmetry breaking also affects this uh, chaos. So the idea is, of course, uh, there is nothing really universal that is coming out of it. It seems like still a phenomenology of different things that I have been telling you. Uh, but idea is that maybe uh, this gives some indications that this Lyapunov exponent gives you some complementary way to look into dynamics and symmetry breaking uh, and maybe give you more information than what you typically capture from standard relaxations and other standard correlation functions. Okay, so that is the sort of the main message here. Okay, so now let me go to the second part. 
and this is uh, actually uh, uh, going back to the classical system. Uh, I'll try to connect to a quantum system also, uh, this part. So this is the thing. So what we discussed so far is the effect of uh, quantum mechanics and interplay of quantum mechanics with chaos. But now I'll try to discuss, uh, it's, as I mentioned earlier, that you can have systems where there is actually transition in many body chaos. Okay? And uh, I'll discuss a system where you don't have transition any any other thing, no dynamical transition. Only transition you see in this uh, uh, quantity uh, related to Lyapunov exponent. Okay? So this is what I'm going to discuss, a classical system, uh, classical system with noise and dissipation. And I'll show that there is a surprising chaotic to non-chaotic transitions in such system. Okay? Uh, so before that, let me just uh, briefly mention about uh, chaotic to non-chaotic transition. Uh, so there are different kinds of transitions that people have studied. So one example that we studied by generalizing this SYK model that I mentioned. Uh, so you can actually generalize the SYK model by adding some more degrees of freedom, like some extra set of fermions. And what, you, what we found uh, some time ago that if you tune a certain parameter in this model, I'll not go into the detail of the parameter, uh, that's not very relevant. So what is important is that you can tune some parameter in some generalized SYK model, and you can get uh, a exactly solvable model for a non-Fermi liquid to a Fermi liquid transition. Okay, so as I mentioned that non-Fermi liquids are distinguished by this uh, maximal chaos. Here I have put uh, KB and H bar to be one. Okay, so it's actually two pi KBT by H bar that bound. So what we showed that there is a uh, model where you can actually induce a transition where it goes from some strongly chaotic regime, which is a non-Fermi liquid, to a weakly chaotic regime where the Lyapunov exponent goes like T square, okay, which is very specific to Fermi liquid. So this is one example of a chaotic uh, transition, chaos, transition in chaos, that you're going from one type of chaotic fixed point to another type of chaotic fixed point. And these two chaotic fixed point distinguishes non-Fermi liquid and Fermi liquid. Okay, so this is one example of this. There is another example which is probably related to the example, uh, the uh, problem that I'm going to discuss next, which is which are known as this paradigm of uh, measurement induced uh, entanglement transitions. Okay. So I'll not again go into the details of the system. So basically these are some quantum circuits, namely that you have some qubits and you have some operations, uh, some unitary and non-unitary operations. So what you do, do is you take a quantum circuit, so imagine these are some qubits, and you do some operations which sort of entangles this qubit, okay? Uh, so some uh, two spin operations. Uh, so you do in a discrete time, you do this unitary operations and then you do some measurements where you collapse this qubit. Let's say the qubit was like a, uh, you collapse it to up state or down state, only so often, okay? Uh, in some discrete time. Uh, so it turns out that this kind of system undergoes a transition um, in entanglement, uh, which is from what is known as volume law to area law entanglement. Uh, but the, again, not going into detail of it, uh, the point is that these are also thought of a kind of chaotic to non-chaotic transition, although here the chaos is characterized by this entanglement. And there is some relation that you can put, um, uh, get in this kind of circuits model between the OTOC and the entanglement which again I'm not going to discuss. So this is an example. Uh, so basically this system, what is happening is that if you do too many measurements uh, too often, then the systems uh, sort of uh, uh, go undergoes this transition. Okay. So imagine that you have taken a quantum system and looking at it many times. Uh, and then what happens is it just collapses into some state, uh, right? And that's a transition. It is Zeno's paradox, but it is much more softer. So Zeno's paradox, it completely collapses. Hmm. So it, this one com doesn't completely collapse. It still has a dynamics. So it's still not a completely collapsed state. It will go on evolving, right? Mm -hmm. But this evolution between these two limits, uh, so Zeno's paradox, if you do any measurement continuously, it is just collapses, right? So here you do discrete time. So you will have some uh, measurement rate and some, up to some finite measurement rate, you will still have a dynamics uh, with volume law entanglement. And then after that, you have, again, still have some dynamics, but a lower entangle. So measure, by measurement, you mean some random time-dependent perturbation? Uh, it is actually a projective measurement. Projective time-dependent. Yes. 
Yeah. So it's not a perturbation, you're just collapsing, but locally. Some local. Huh. Okay, so this is also a uh, thing. So now let's come to the system uh, uh, very quickly. So actually what I'm going to discuss is a very simple system, uh, which is a system of, uh, all we all know, 1D chain of oscillators, uh, 1D chain of couple oscillators, connected by springs, but these springs are anharmonic, okay, in general. Uh, so this system is, as I said, classical, described by Newtonian dynamics. And uh, what I'm going to discuss, uh, without going into much uh, uh, review of these things, uh, is that two models, uh, one model which has uh, this, as I said, anharmonic uh, uh, coupling, which is of this quartic form. So you have the standard quadratic coupling, and then you have this quartic coupling. And then another model, so this is a non-integrable model, Okay, so typically this model will thermalize and all that. And then there is this integrable model, uh, which is also very well known, which is this Toda chain, which has this kind of exponential potential. Okay. Uh, so this model is integrable because there are large number of constants. So, uh, uh, so these are the two models that I'm going to discuss. Okay. Uh, so first thing, uh, I'll come to the transition. Uh, but the first thing, let's ask that how do you uh, discuss OTOC in this classical model, okay? Because, uh, so classical model, you do what I started with, that is you look into trajectories, but now these trajectories are many body trajectories because you have many particles or many oscillators. Uh, so imagine that you have these two trajectories, which I now call A and B, okay? And then uh, I, what I do uh, to uh, look into this or define a OTOC, this is how the classical OTOC is defined. Uh, that you take these uh, two trajectories and you pick one spin, let's say at zero, oh, sorry, not spin, one oscillator, let's say at the position zero. And what you do initially, you just give a small deviation between this copy A and B. Okay, so this is the original protocol. The difference is that uh, I am only creating a local perturbation, okay, local uh, difference between these two trajectories. So now, uh, so now, what you can do, you can look into some uh, functions like that, which is the difference of these two trajectories, okay? At a given time, after at t equal to zero, I have done this uh, perturbation, okay? So I have given a local perturbation at zero, and I am looking how this perturbation spreads as a function of space, and how it grows as a function of time, okay? And this is done by averaging over all possible initial configurations of this uh, chain, uh, this 1D chain, which is averaged over thermal initial conditions. So imagine that you generate many thermal initial conditions for this interacting chain. And then for each of this configuration, you create two trajectories, one deviated from other a little bit, and they evolve. Okay, and then I calculate this quantity. So first, look, let's look at whether this is chaotic or not, right, in the interacting case. So indeed, you find that when you have non-interacting case, which is u equal to 0, this interaction is 0, you find that there is no growth of OTOC. It actually decays, okay? But as soon as you put some u, it actually has an exponential growth in some regime. And as you increase u, that this lambda L, which is related to, so this is, by the way, plotted in uh, log scale, okay? So this, there should be a linear regime. Uh, if there is an exponential growth. So what you find as you increase u, that this exponential growth uh, increases. So indeed, if you put interaction, this model become chaotic, and without interaction, it's non-chaotic. So you can actually show, which I'm not showing, that the integrable Toda chain that I mentioned doesn't have any exponential growth, okay, which you expect, that integrable model should not have chaos. And you can also see a light cone uh, for some interaction, and you can extract this butterfly velocity, which I mentioned. Okay, I'll not go into the detail of it. So now let's come to this transition uh, for the remaining, uh, yeah, I'll try to end in five minutes. Hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Harmonic chain, hmm. what you have is a sound velocity. Yes. So what is the connection between that and the butterfly? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, so generally these velocities, uh, okay, so here actually we have not studied uh, the sound wave velocity. So yeah, we have not actually compared, but we have done for some other system with spin waves and all. So typically, these velocities are different. Different. Uh, so maybe at very low temperature, they become close. Uh, but uh, at finite temperature, there is some renormalization of these velocities, and they are different. So this is actually uh, affected by interaction. 
it's not only the uh, i mean interaction in a fundamental way not only a just it's a, clear, clear yeah okay so now let's come to this fact that how do you induce a transition uh, like as i mentioned that uh, a noise induced transition so what we consider is a very standard thing which is the stochastic langeva dynamic so you take this system and you put dissipation you put noise and they satisfy this fluctuation dissipation relation okay and i look at the same system which without noise is either non integrable or integrable okay and i ask uh, can i define uh, can i define uh, still otoc and i can uh, what happens all right uh, so one thing i should mention that uh, this model uh, actually this langeva model uh, as we know i mean um, some of you must be uh, know, i mean knowing it very well that uh, this can be related to some uh, limit classical limit of this kind of caldera legate model okay uh, where you have some uh, oscillators coupled to some infinite oscillator path but it has also relations this kind of langeva dynamics uh, has also relations uh, with certain kind of weak quantum measurements uh, dynamics uh, that is known from some early work by caves and milburn uh, so you can actually derive this similar kind of langeva equations for a measurement process okay uh, so this is the connection so what i am trying to imply is that this model uh, uh, might be related to a, a quantum measurement model uh, as a classical limit of a quantum system okay uh, but i'll not uh, go into any detail of this uh, any further i'll just discuss what happens in a model uh, in a few slides okay so now first question is how do you define this otoc now the problem is that if you have a noise and let's say you take these two trajectories and if you uh, uh, kick these two trajectories with this noise so noise is effectively keeping kicking it every particle at each instant of time right and this is random so if you have completely non, non random realization of noise on these two trajectories there will be nothing meaningful okay because uh, there is no correlation it is like uh, perturbing the system every time okay so it turns out the meaningful way to do it is actually put exactly same noise right as a function of time and position between these two trajectories and it turns out there then you can define exactly same way the otoc and it will have a exponential growth and everything that i mentioned uh, so that is the idea that you have to put exactly same noise and you can define then the same quantity that i mentioned and let me just uh, discuss the result okay so this is what happens so what so this is what happens so what i showed you earlier uh, so this is the noise strength or dissipation strength okay which are related in this model so if you stay uh, so earlier what i showed if you have any finite u it was chaotic okay it was exponentially growing so what you find here that if you start with a large u indeed it is still chaotic okay it's exponentially growing log scale here exponentially growing exponentially growing but as you go on decreasing u depending on the value of gamma it actually goes from exponential growth to exponential decay okay so this is the noise induced transition so due to the strength as a finite strength of the noise and interaction strength the ratio of it you actually go from chaotic to non chaotic okay so this is the transition that i was mentioning and you can actually see it nicely in the lyapunov exponent Uh, so there are these are the different plots of different noise strength as a function of u as you can see for a given noise strength the lyapunov exponent goes to zero at some finite u and as you increase the noise strength the, the u decreases okay and you can see similar thing in the butterfly velocity that also uh, uh, seems to go to zero in fact you can see nicely in this light cone so that light cone when you go below this critical u actually uh, is destroyed okay so by this noise so this transition is happening in a very well known langeva dynamics which we have all studied and we don't see any other any any other quantity you see like uh, transport and other thing we will not see any transition like this but there is no thermodynamic phase transition but you see this transition in chaos okay so that is the main thing and uh, actually much more weird that thing happens in the toda model Uh, there initially to start with uh, so this is as a function of gamma noise strength uh, and what you see that initially as i showed you or uh, claimed that there is no noise so lyapunov exponent was zero 
so what chaos actually is noise actually does it actually makes a integrable model first chaotic okay so then the chaos increases and then again it starts going down and eventually it goes away okay so it has a reentrant transition in an integrable chain uh, initially noise makes system chaotic and then it makes it non chaotic okay and there is some weird thing also happens about uh, butterfly velocity it actually seems to divert at this uh, limit uh, so that i'll not talk about and another uh, quite interesting thing about this system is this transition actually has a critical property meaning there is a critical finite size scaling which you can obtain from finite size scaling as a function of system size if you look into the butterfly velocity you can actually collapse uh, the different data point uh, for different system size with a nice uh, scaling form okay so this is a truly a transition which has looked like having a critical characteristic okay okay so with that let me uh, stop uh, so what i tried to show in this part is that so noise uh, can do weird thing uh, even for a very well known dynamics like a langevin dynamics uh, if you look into chaos you can actually reveal uh, new dynamical phenomena namely a dynamical transition uh, which has critical property and as i said that this transition actually may be thought about as some uh, measurement induced transition in some quantum model okay of course that model we have not studied yet but uh, we are working on it uh, trying to understand this from that idea uh, that why is there a transition in langeva dynamics okay and with that uh, the first part i tried to discuss this uh, interplay between chaos quantum fluctuations replica symmetry breaking and glassy dynamics i saw that chaos may give us uh, complementary information and finally i think the main message is that maybe that chaos is another useful uh, tool even for many body system uh, so typically it has been used so far for few body non linear systems but uh, it seems that it has a lot of potential uh, for standard many body systems so with that let me thank you for your Uh, questions? Yeah. Can you can you answer how to understand this butterfly velocity better? Yeah. So no. So you are trying to understand uh, why there is a velocity, or I is, mean, I understand what is the Lyapunov of exponent. Huh. What what really is a butterfly velocity? Oh. Uh, yeah. Maybe I can. Yeah. So the idea is that uh, so. if you look at uh, let's say some uh, this otoc uh, right so uh, otoc as a function of position and time meaning that you choose two operators which are at different point in time and space right so then this otoc will be function of both position and time right now the claim here is that if you look at a sort of it sort of works in many system that there is a part of otoc even at a uh, non zero x which is growing like e to the power lambda l t right so this picture that i was showing so here it is growing like this now you have given the perturbation here right so this perturbation takes some time to reach okay okay so some time to reach there so this point will because you have given perturbation here it will start growing fast but then this will grow a little bit later this will go a little bit later because there is a finite speed at which this perturbation reaches because the local perturbation other part of the system only knows it after some time okay yes. so it's a, so if you have like uh, if you have a in classical uh, situation you have a particle and you kind of so if you have a set of particles and mm. you kind of disturb one right and how its trajectory would have been otherwise mm. so that tells uh, that is told by the lyapunov exponent but right. because of this disturbance you could have disturbed uh, adjoining Otherwise. particles right. and they exactly so in classical right. situation you would measure it like that right exactly okay exactly yes more questions you are at the back so uh, this in this langevin model you usually consider the gaussian white noise right so okay. it's so 
So usually the intuition is uh, it's uh, it should be chaotic. Uh -huh. So do you have any insight why it's becoming non-chaotic when you are incorporating noise? Yeah, so that's the thing, right? So it actually depends on what is your definition of chaos, right? So the particular definition I show it's a very specific type of definition. Uh -huh. So it is in some sense of course chaotic because this noise, I mean for any noise value, uh -huh. because it is thermalizing the system, right? I mean, we know that Langevin dynamics exactly. will lead exactly. to thermalization. Exactly. So, in that sense, it is chaotic. I am not saying in that sense it is non-chaotic. Hmm. But what I am trying to say is that if you define this very particular quantity, which is how two copies of the system are correlated, so it's a very different kind of measurement, right? right. So, in that measurement, this uh, the noise is actually making it less chaotic, and most probably because what is happening is that you are uh, kicking the system, right? every instant. So it is more like trying to, so let's say the system was trying to evolve some, somewhere and the other system was trying to evolve somewhere but you have at in that instant you have given exactly same noise here and here. So both the noise tries to work, sorry, exactly same direction, exactly same strength, right? So in some sense it is trying to quote unquote collapse the system to a particular position, okay? It's not able to do it completely. So what is happening is these two trajectories, which otherwise would have been completely chaotic, okay? Because I am trying to put exactly same bias to go to uh, or some force, hmm. right? Uh, which is exactly same in these two trajectories. They are sort of trying to come close again. But but your kicking is random, right? I'm kicking is random, but they are same exactly in two copies. Oh, okay. So that is important. Okay, so that is kind yeah. of order into the right. Data. Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. So can I can I then uh, interpret it, the noise as a measurement itself from these? Yes. Dynamics? So actually, this model that I mentioned, you can explicitly show as quantum this Langevin dynamics. It will not satisfy fluctuation dissipation like I took. Okay. But you can show that there is a Langevin dynamics exactly from that measurement process. I see. I see. Yeah. Thanks. It's a very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, Shita. Uh, just to comment on that, I, I think in classical chaos also there's an analog because mm -hmm. we know that noise destroys the fine structure. Mm -hmm. Like for example, if you uh, apply chaos, uh, sorry, if you apply noise to the usual period doubling uh -huh. root to chaos, right. then beyond a particular level of noise okay, it destroys the fine structure and mm -hmm. get a transition to non-chaotic mm -hmm. activity. So I think okay, so that so there's a classical, anal to that. classical analog uh, of this. Right. Yeah, so I was, uh, uh, I wanted to ask a separate mm -hmm. question which is like, you know, long back in 88, I think Sompolinsky and co-workers mm -hmm. were looking at, uh, you know, transition to chaos mm -hmm. in this uh, neural network models, mm -hmm. which were essentially, you know, spin glass yeah, systems. Right. Uh, so they introduced a small asymmetry. Mm -hmm. And they showed that as they increase the gain parameter, mm -hmm. uh, essentially there's a transition from yes. a stationary phase to I a see. chaotic phase. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering uh, what you talked about, does that have a connection to what uh, Sompolinsky at all? Yeah, so the Sompolinsky paper I have seen. Uh, so actually uh, the way uh, they calculate this, uh, I mean you can actually calculate this OTOC in the way they do. I mean there can be an analytical formalism to calculate, which is very similar to the Sompolinsky's approach. Although uh, I have not really compared this thing that you are mentioning, that in the neural network when there is this transition. So that uh, thing I have not compared, but uh, the method and the setup is very same, actually. Yeah. Yes, Shantan. You discuss about this uh, first model you had mm -hmm. in the spin glass. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did you look at the eigenvalue spectrum of that model, like uh, how the higher eigenvalues look like, or whether from no. there one can get an idea about uh, what is yeah, happening? Yeah, so we have, no, we have not looked at, but some other people have looked at in a related model. So this model is slightly harder to exact diagonalize because, uh, I mean, these positions are sort of, I mean, there is no, I mean, you have to truncate it and all, right, um, to define a proper Hilbert space. And, all these things, but uh, people have looked into similar models, which are uh, P-spin glass with transverse field and uh, with Ising spins, uh, not uh, this kind of soft spin. And there, uh, people have seen, uh, or at least there are claims of seeing localization transition in the spectrum. Although this bit controversial, but 
so, so this transition happens exactly like no so actually it turns out that transition. this uh, localization transition at least the claim is is separate from the glass transition so localization can be there even in the paramagnetic phase it's not that localization implies glass okay but that result is slightly controversial because it's a very small system numerics and yeah Any more questions? Last question from me. So, yeah. in, the, in this diagram, so have people done the classical system and looked at uh, the uh, this? No. Yeah. Yeah, because it would be curious yeah. to know what I mean, what the relevance of this temperature scale is. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Shumilan, for this. Thanks. <laughs>